Hi, Susan. So today's study, we're talking about God's law stemming from the immutability of God's being of righteousness, holiness, and true wisdom. All wisdom is found in God. But God's law, and uh, as we go through this study, remember, these are steps that lead us to the Savior, Jesus Christ. So as you look at God's law, let's take, let's, let's look at a couple of verses. Set the trumpet to your lips. One like a vulture is over the house of the Lord because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. God is not only our creator, but our judge. And notice how he says, you know, get the trumpet ready. One like a vulture. A vulture is symbolic of death. And the reason the prophet Hosea is saying this is because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. Second Kings. And you'll see this consistency. They despised his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and the warnings that he gave them. They went after false idols and became false. Notice this. They went after false idols and became false. No matter, you know, when we're not worshiping the one true God through Jesus Christ, we're going to we're going to have an idol. And that idol is not something that doesn't affect us. It absolutely does. They went after false idols and they became false. How, what happened there? They followed the nations that were around them, concerning whom the Lord had commanded them that they should not do like them. As, as the Lord talks about that in 2 Kings, he also mentions that in the, in, in the book of Corinthians, in the New Testament, he talks about being yoked with unbelievers. And what does he mean by that? Listen, while we're living in the United States of America, we don't want to pick up the habits of the United States of America. We don't want our, our, our understanding of God to come from the United States of America. We want it to come from scripture. Why? Because the idols that will be presented to us, right, will lure us away. So we don't follow the nations. Isaiah 24. The earth lies defiled under its inhabitants. The inhabitants of the land have defiled the earth. For they have transgressed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. Really, they have no faith. See, there's a religion that we do, but that doesn't mean it produces faith. It produces a trust. A matter of fact, when you have time, you read Isaiah 24, it's literally an indictment across the whole world. Take a glance at Isaiah 24. Just to get the idea here. Because God created the whole world, right? And every single creature, every single person is accountable to him. Look what he says in Isaiah 24, verse 1. Behold, the Lord will empty the earth and make it desolate. And he will twist its surface and scatter its inhabitants. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the slave, so with his master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the creditor, so with the debtor. The earth shall be utterly empty and utterly plundered for the Lord has spoken this word. The whole earth. That's why when we are talking to people, there's only one God. And, and in conversations, what they try to do is, well, that's your belief. No, 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 no. 
There is only one God, and we're all answered to him. We all, are, we all have to answer. And this prophecy, of course, hasn't come through yet, but Isaiah is batting a pure 1,000, okay? Hasn't this the be? And we can look back and see all those prophecies he has stated. Hosea adds, and, and this is this is crucial because but like Adam, but like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly with me. Now, this is important because there's a movement out there that doesn't believe in the covenant of works that God set with Adam. And here it's very clear, like Adam, the people, like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. Adam broke the same covenant. There they dealt, what was it, faithlessly with me. They didn't believe in him. That doesn't mean they didn't go to the, they didn't do their worship. Didn't mean they didn't do their day atonements. They did these things. But how many put faith in what God said that does? How many trusted in themselves? Deuteronomy 10, 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial, and he takes no bribe. We have judges in our land who has everybody's hands in their pockets to fulfill laws and things. It's uh, I just read this morning, and I think I posted on the on our uh, discipleship on WhatsApp, is Connecticut is passing a law to be a refuge for those who had an abortion. And I think it's Michigan, but I'll have to re read that article, but I think it's Michigan or Missouri that says that they're gonna have a law that if a state is gonna give, uh, if a state is gonna offer refuge to someone whom we are criminalizing abortion we're going to go after that state so connecticut's going to put a law to say that uh they're going to counter that it's and it was a 26 to 6 vote for becoming a haven for those who will have an abortion in states that will not permit it and they'll get judges who are appointed to do these things. It's almost time, folks, where you almost got to tell the politicians, have you forgotten you too die? You will be judged. You are accountable for what you do. And a, a lot more so since government is a representation of what God gave man in order to, to do his laws and to have a good society. Daniel 9, therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity, it has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done. And we have not obeyed his voice. God doesn't do anything in a vindictive way. He does everything in a righteous way. Here's him. Here's the standard. He is holy. If you ever look at the gods that the nations produce, they're no different than the human beings that made them. Job says, does God pervert justice? It's a rhetorical question, no. Or does the Almighty pervert the right? Nope. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. They have no footing at the time of judgment, the, the wicked. No footing at all. Nothing that they can stand on. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. So we look at these verses, and, we, and we're sharing with people, we're talking to people, we want to say, do you realize that God is not a judge like what we see here? He can't be paid off. You can't smile or do something nice for somebody and think because you're that type of person, God's going to waive his justice. 
Here's a promise in Acts 17, 31. He says, because he has set a day on which he will judge the world in what? In righteousness through a man whom he has appointed. And he furnished proof to all people by raising him from the dead. See, the implication of Christ's resurrection is this. He rose body and soul. He rose from the dead, right? That means he's coming back. He's coming back. Those who contend with the Lord will be terrified. See, those who want to argue, while we're in the flesh, we, we, we have these disrespectful words that we talk, that people call God, the old man, uh, you know, different things like that. He has, and it says, those who contend with the Lord, those who seek to go against his rules, his statutes, will be terrified. Against them, he will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. No matter how much we want to compartmentalize or segregate the human race by religions, denominations, ethnicities, things like that, God will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and he will exalt the horn of his anointed. He who justifies the wicked, now he's talking about those who are corrupt. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. You notice that? So the person who justifies the wicked and who condemns the righteous are both alike. They're an abomination to the Lord. He has zero toleration for that. Nahum, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. Slow to anger, great in power. The Lord will by no means clear the guilty. No matter how much the person outside of Christ, whatever they violated God's law, he says it. The Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in a whirlwind and a storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He will sweep them right through. Exodus, keep far from a false charge. Don't accuse somebody wrongly. And do not kill the innocent and the righteous. For I will not acquit the wicked. So God is telling us he will not acquit the wicked. If you did not love the Lord your God with all your heart, if you did not keep holy his day, if you said his name in vain, notice these charges. Isaiah, woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong drink who acquit the guilty for a bribe and deprive the innocent of his right. Bad leaders, that's, this is what they do. Now, the question comes in, and I want to touch on this now, is you notice how in Proverbs 17, 5, 17, 15, he who justifies the wicked, what is this Roman, in the book of Romans, God justifies the ungodly. Now, there is in the Roman Catholic system, and I'm going to touch upon this, is because in the Roman system, justification is based on you. Their idea of justification is God infuses in a person grace. And when he infuses grace, he also infuses righteousness. And you cooperate with the Holy Spirit to become more righteous. Because God has to punish the wicked. Now, see, so you have to earn your righteousness. Now, you're this is the Roman system. Now, you're never going to earn enough. So what happens is if you die, you end up having to go to purgatory until you become righteous. Now, just so we understand this, on the basis of Paul's statement in Romans 4, 5, 
God justifies the ungodly. The same Greek phrase that's used in Exodus 23, 7 and Isaiah 5, 23. Here's Exodus 23, 7. Keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent and the righteous for I will not acquit the wicked. See that term right there, the wicked? Okay, and also acquit the guilty. This part right here. In Isaiah 5, 23, that same Greek phrase is used in the LXX. What is the LXX? That was the Hebrew Bible translated into the Greek language. So the word that was used for the ungodly, which God justifies the ungodly, is the same word. Now the charge that the Roman church says is we make God justify sinners. Now, Here's how God does it. And I got this quote. This is from J.I. Packer because Packer packed it in perfect. He says this, for God does precisely what he commanded human judges not to do. What do the human judges do? Remember what we read? We read it in Isaiah, and, and right here, keep far away, do not kill the innocent and righteous for I will not acquit the wicked. For who will quit the wicked for a bribe, who take a bribe? Notice what he says. But he also declares that he does it in a manner designed precisely to demonstrate his justice. See, God demonstrates true justice. And at the same time, he doesn't acquit the sinner. Here's how he does it. In Romans chapter 3, verse 25 and 26, whom God put forward as a propitiation. Propitiation is that Greek word that says he not only takes away sin, but the word also includes taking away God's anger. God's holy. He's angry at sin. So he says, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. So Christ's blood propitiates God. It takes away God's anger from the one who has faith in him and also cleanses him of his sin. Now, the next line. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins how in verse 26 it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just see this and the justifier of the one who has faith in jesus how is god just not like the wicked rulers they take a bribe and let the person go. God still punishes my sins. He still punishes our sins, but he punishes them in Jesus Christ. He has to punish sin. Christ is our surety. God justifies us. See, God justifies on just grounds, namely, that the claims of God's law upon each one of us has been fully satisfied by Jesus Christ's doings and dying in our place. What Jesus did and died, he did it in our place. So that when Christ takes my sin, he gives me his righteousness. The imputed righteousness is what I am given. This is important. So as we see ourselves condemned under God's law, the only refuge, the only place, the only person we can run to is Jesus Christ. And by faith, we believe he propitiated the Father, took away his anger, and paid our penalty. That's pure justice. So God punishes sin. 
Just like he says, he will not acquit the guilty. Christ became a curse for us. God the judge. In Exodus 34, 6, 8, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, the inward thought of sin, the, the, the outward transgression of his law, you know, think of these things. But who will by no means clear the guilty? Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. How does Moses respond to that? Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. How, when we read God's word, do we ever tremble at his word? Do we ever say, Lord, if it wasn't for you opening my eyes, electing me to believe in Jesus Christ, you would have visited me in my time and charged me with all my sins. And I like the way the Holy Spirit made sure this word, he quickly bowed down. Quickly. That, that's motivation to worship. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. God's wrath is revealed from heaven. He reveals it through everything that's been impacting us in our lives. And it's against all ungodliness, not some, all of it, all unrighteousness. And one of the things about being ungodly and unrighteous, these same suppress the truth. And if we live in the state of not coming to Christ, of filling ourselves up with religion or trying to do things to merit God's favor. He says, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. Every single thing done, he will render to that person. And the idea there is the heart and penitent are your storing up wrath. That means every single second of the day, you're compounding and compounding and compounding God's anger against you. That some will say in the book of Revelation, why was I born? Why did I live so long? And one of the benefits of living in an empire in this period of time is we have a lot more years that are granted to us with medical and all these things. But how many more days added to our lives because we live in this time of medical miracles and everything else, are we storing up more and more wrath to the day of judgment? God the judge, and he commanded us to do something, to preach to the people, to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. This Jesus, right, who resurrected, will come back and God appointed him to be the judge of the living and the dead. He will judge. Acts, God has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And again, of this he has given assurance by what? Raising him from the dead. Peter, by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So even 
the, the, the book is clear. They all say the same thing. There will be a destruction of the ungodly. Which takes us back now to the covenant of works. Now, the covenant of works is deceptive. Some utilize it as the Roman church, the cults, and many others, that as long as I'm a good person, as long as I'm not like Sarducci across the street or whatever, we measure ourselves by human beings. That's how humans do it. But what is this covenant of works? The first covenant made with man was a covenant of works, wherein life was promised to Adam, right? Life was promised to Adam and in him, to his posterity, upon a condition of perfect and personal obedience. Then the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to tend it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, from any tree of the garden you may freely eat. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For on the day that you eat from it, you will certainly die. And that death was spiritual death because that Hebrew right here, you will certainly die. Literally, it should be translated, dying, you will die. So all he had to do was obey, but he didn't. So his entire posterity, the entire his entire posterity is under that covenant. Jesus comes under the covenant of works and obeys perfectly for us. Mark. Yes, Stephen. So how come these other denominations, and I'll say specifically the Catholics, they never preach God's wrath? You know, that's a good question, Stephen. I've been in a lot of contemporary churches with the, with the music and everything else to see what they were up to. They don't teach God's wrath. A mm -hmm. matter of fact, you know, you know, in the 30 years, I think I... I heard God's wrath. I could count them on a hand. Sermons that were about it. I, Man. but I got a lot from Jonathan Edwards. But he was around the 18th century. They don't teach that, and you know why? Because the God that's being manufactured today is a tolerant God. So they overemphasize love. You know, you have love. What do you do with justice? That's why there's no. There's no talking about the character of God or the attributes. Again, here's another reason, Steve, why the reformer said, let's download the scriptures. Let's take the character of God. Why? Because eternal life hinges on me knowing God. And let's take it. The modern church don't do that. That's how far away they are. So the wrath of God, the justice of God, they're not there. They have God's goodness, but they don't understand that God's goodness also means he does all things for the sake of his people. That might mean taking the Egyptians and drowning them in, in, in the sea. Especially with the sun, God is good. He took Pharaoh's firstborn and the firstborn of Egypt. They're praising God's good, but if you go to a church today, God's good, health, wealth, prosperity, all these things. That, we're in an age where false gods, false systems, and our world tells us that's just another religion. That's okay. You could believe that. No, no, that's not how it works. Yeah, See, the law, know. and this, th th these things we have to remember the law does not show mercy. The law doesn't show mercy, it knows nothing of grace or forgiveness. Always remember that. The law has no mercy in it. No grace, no forgiveness. The law is the law. It demands perfection. Because whoever transgresses in one tiny detail transgresses the whole of God's law. Look at our, look at our cousin James said. Whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at one point has become guilty of all. Nevertheless, knowing 
that a person is not justified by the works of the law. Do you see that? We're not justified by the works of the law. Why? Because the law shows no mercy, no grace. There is no forgiveness there. It's exact. So he says, knowing that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. How do we get justified? How does the judge declare me righteous? Because of Jesus Christ. That's the judge speaking. He makes the declaration. He justifies us. How does God justify us? Sinners through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. So if there's anybody here that literally thinks, I can get in here without coming to Jesus Christ, the law is going to stand before you. Cursed is anyone who does not fulfill the words of this law by doing them. And all the people shall say, Amen. Now they all said, Amen. Sound like the Southern Baptist Church back in Deuteronomy, right? They all said, Amen. But here's the problem they didn't keep it. Cursed is anyone who does not fulfill the words of this law. Galatians, for all who are of the works of the law are under a curse. You see this? All who are. If you're looking to be right before God by doing good, by obeying God, you're under the curse. Why? Because the Lord said, curse is anyone who does not fulfill the words of this law by doing them. For it is written, notice, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to do them. See, if you're going to get justified by the law, you got to do the law. And you, there is one person who did. His name is Jesus Christ. He did it for us. Deuteronomy 28, but it shall come about if you do not, notice, if you do not obey the Lord your God, to be careful, to follow, all his commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. The idea of being overtaken by him means your conscience becomes seared and you can't see the hope of salvation anymore. So if I could just sum this up, the law and its requirements... Because if we're going to meet a lot of people, if we, if we encounter the Roman Catholic, they're looking at this. We count the cult. We encounter the natural man outside as long as he's good enough. If you encounter the Hindu, as long as they're good enough and they'll get another chance at reincarnation, here's what the law says. The law of God requires such things that we are unable to perform. Everybody in agreement? The law requires absolute perfection. Why? Our creator is perfect. That's what he demands. The law does not accept how hard we try to obey it. It doesn't accept that. You can try so hard to obey it. It doesn't accept it. One breach of the law, the sinner loses all ability for ever keeping any part of it. Once you broke the law, you lose all ability for ever keeping any other part of it. You're guilty. Any one breach of God's law binds the person to eternal death. One. The law requires unbroken obedience. Unbroken obedience. 
Once the law is broken, it cannot be satisfied by obedience. Okay, I didn't go. I, I didn't go to. I didn't. Uh, I stole. I'm not going to steal no more. That's not how it works. The law does not accept repentance. See, you know why the law doesn't re accept repentance? Because repentance is part of the covenant of grace, not the covenant of works. The law lays open humanity's misery without any remedy coming from it. See, what's the law? What God set that law so we can know sin. That's a favor God has given us. We can see that we violated them. See, we can see we broke his laws. But once the law opens up humanity's misery, there's no remedy that comes from that law. There is no appeal to it, nor repeal of it. I can't appeal to the law and say I tried. And I can't say the law has been repealed because I'm part of the United Church of Christ in 2022. No. God's law is unchanged. His moral law doesn't change. It's based on his character of holiness. So just because a church says, uh, or a state, or a nation says, men could marry men, women could marry women, that does not repeal God's law. The more the law comes to be revealed, the more our corruptions get ignited. See, we're sinners. So when we encounter God's holy law, it doesn't say, oh, I'm going to try. It actually ignites our sin in us. It arouses the sin in us. And God shows no partiality. Now get this. For all who have sinned, Without the law. Think about this. For everybody who sinned without the law, these are those countries that never, those natives in the uh, in Timbuktu or in South uh, America, God wrote the law in man's heart. Their conscience ex accuses them, excuses them. Even though they didn't have the law, what does he say? For all who have sinned without the law, will also perish without the law. Why? Because they're sinners. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. There is no escaping the reality of judgment unless you're covered in Jesus Christ's righteousness. Jude, chapter 115. God will execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things that the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now that's, that's potent. See, when God executes judgment at all, he's going to convict you know, when, when the judge convicts you, you're condemned. And he says, all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that the ungodly sinners have spoken against God, he will execute judgment on them. So what's the call? He says here in 2 Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. The only hope the ungodly has is God using us to bring them the good news. They got to hear the good news. 
if they don't hear the good news, that person that we sort of say hi to, who does nice things for us, we're causing that person to not know the remedy. Look, we tell them, they reject it, it's okay. God may send somebody else to do some more watering or planting, right? But always remember, he's called you into his kingdom. We shouldn't be bragging or acting in such a way that, hey, I'm all set. I'm not worried about anybody else. If anything, we should be. And next week, uh, Lord willing, when we get together, we'll talk about the covenant is a bond in blood sovereignly administered. This is by O. Palmer Robertson. The best quote on that covenant of grace where he says a covenant is a bond in blood sovereignly administered. When God enters into a covenantal relationship with men, he sovereignly institutes a life and death bond. A covenant is a bond in blood or a bond of life and death sovereignly administered. God sovereignly enters into that like he did with Abraham. Took him from his father and his brothers. Any questions? Yes, Steve. No. No, the other one. Okay, Catherine, I, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. Okay. So I have a question about defining God's anger. Okay. Right? Yep. So, you know, we get angry because of disappointment. Wrong. But God... he's, broken, he's breaking up, Mark. I can't hear you. You're, you're breaking up. I'm sorry. Up. Okay, can sorry. you hear me now? I can hear right. you. Maybe I, I probably have to get closer. So how do we define God's anger? Uh, meaning, you know, we, we understand when we get angry, you know, it's because of disappointment. Somebody doesn't do something right. Right. I, I, I didn't catch that part uh, after, you know, we get angry when somebody disappoints us or something like that. But describe right. God's anger, right? Right, right. That's All really right. my question. Yeah. See, Steve. I, I, I would say the best way to describe God's anger is what he did to his son. Right. Think, of, think of this. Here's his son in whom he said, uh, he's perfect, he's good. The son, you know, his eternal relationship. And look what he put him through. Right. Because of sin and... Because that's a very good question, Steve. That's an mm. excellent question. Because the, the, the best picture I could show us is what he did to the innocent one. And it shows how actual, how holy God is, how perfectly righteous he is, and how perfect. I mean, you know, it, a, a person says, How do you define perfection? It's like it's it's perfect. You can't add to him because then he wouldn't be perfect. You can't take away. So when right. he inflicts that, that anger, or even if we look at in the Old Covenant, uh, in, in the Old Testament, uh, how God is jealous for his people. Now, Steve, we, all we, we, we raise some children, and there's the good aspect of jealousy, and mm -hmm. that is jealous to protect our children from the ones down the street that wear black leather jackets and comb their hair back. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, there's that fear, and that jealousy. That's the same kind of jealousy. Now that, that godly child that God elected and saved is wrong by the ungodly. Look at his vindictive justice now on that person. Right. Right. You know, uh, did that answer the question? I well, it, it did. It did. I think, you know, a lot of people think of, of God's anger. Yeah. You know, punches its fist. Yeah. Right, right. That's not what God's exactly, because <laughs> when you think of how Paul puts God's 
law is righteous, just, and holy. Mm. And if we were actually to live by, if we were to live by God's law, just say uh, we live by God's law, there would be no, no brokenness, no diseases, you know, that are transmitted sexually. Uh, there would be no murder. There would be a relationship where no one's getting even with something. Think about it. We right. can't, it's so hard that the only way we're going to understand that fully is when we're out of this body and we're in our new home. Amen. And, and even then, when I try to think about it, imagine trying to live in a world without sin. Can't. It's hard. It's it's <laughs> utterly impossible because I'm the sinner trying to figure out what it's like to not to live with me. Right. <laughs> but also, when we go over the covenant that's sealed in blood, we're going to see how God's. You know, when Romans 1 talks about God's wrath is revealed against all ungodliness. If God were not holy, if God were not holy, he'd be like us. And we would just, that was their hard luck or whatever happened to that person. But God will bring all the deeds of darkness out. And when that day of judgment comes, that sunlight, that bright light, will be so manifest that all mouths will be stopped. That verse, all the mouths will be stopped and, will, and the world become guilty before God. Why? Because for the first time in recorded human history, we're not going to be able to say because we're not going to be able to put the blame on anybody because our entire, God will lift the veil and show us us. The sinner will have nothing to say. His indictment will be his very conscience so clear now because he's in front of the Holy One that like Moses, like John, like, like John the Gospel writer, uh, like Isaiah, they're going to fall before him dead because we're on hope. You see how that works? It's amazing. And those are things you could actually really meditate on and really go with for a while, you know, because it's hard to comprehend it. But yet, that's where we trust what God says. He will vindicate the saints. It's like, Steve, when you look at the saints that are under the altar in heaven, and John, in his book of Revelation, gives us this insight. And what do they say? Oh, Lord, how long will it be to you vindicate us? And who are these ones? They were the ones who testified to the word of life, to God's word, and to Jesus Christ. And they were martyred. And they asked, how long, Lord, until you vindicate? Because at the end, God will bring it all to vindication. The atheists will realize he is. Mm. And all the other religions will realize what they did to him. Mm. Any other questions? Brother Coppola, could you close us with a word of prayer? Sure. That it is in the name of Jesus that we believe in and that we pray. Father, we thank you for being with us tonight throughout this study. We want to say thank you, God. Thank you, Holy Father. And may you continue to grant us peace, love, happiness, and most of all, please continue the blessings in the name of your glorious son, Jesus Christ. We all say amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. That was good. That was good, Steve. Well, brothers, I, I, I'm looking forward to coming out in Maine. And I don't want to swim in that pond. <laughs> no, you don't want to swim in that pond. <laughs> no. <laughs> we, have a, we have a guy in North Bradford who just passed away. Uh, he was an older guy. And there was always this running joke that anything that went missing was buried in his farm. Well, they sold the land to kids, and I guess apparently they're digging up cars from the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, everything here. Uh, so you don't know what's in that pond. <laughs> no. No. 
we we still do find things every spring when we're going around the property it's like something else starts poking out of the ground mm -hmm. oh yeah just, okay yeah yeah no body <laughs> no body parts yet that's good that's good <laughs> all right well sometime peter uh debbie uh, uh peter and Catherine, we got to get uh uh you know, let's throw some ideas around let, let let's throw something up there let's see uh I notified Vanguard of what 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 they're to pray about these things, and they're fully supportive of getting something going in a region that doesn't have solid biblical truth. Yeah, you know. So we'll mm -hmm. set something up, and uh, and I want an excuse to go to near Canadian border, Peter, and and, and blast the trumpet across the Trudeau. <laughs> Mark, we'll, we'll bring the shofar. Yeah, the show far. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brothers. All right. All right have, a good night. have a good night. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.